What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that always promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And tonight, while it is a dark subject matter, you're in for a treat. We all know by now that he went from successful attorney to convicted killer. Alec Murdoch now sits in a single cell in the most secure of Kirkland uh, prisons, a Kirkland Correctional Institution in Columbia, South Carolina. And he is on around the clock surveillance from prison officials. So what is his new life like behind bars where he will be for the rest of his life? Got our best guests here. They've all been behind bars for one reason or another. Larry Levine, the man with the sunglasses. He was arrested by FBI Secret Service-led Organized Crime Task Force. He was charged with racketeering, securities fraud, obstruction of justice, and narcotics trafficking. He served time and survived at 11 federal correction uh, institutions of multiple custody and security levels and experienced firsthand the confusion and dangers first-time offenders face when entering federal custody, and that's why he founded and is currently the CEO of Wall Street Prison Consultants, the man who looks like he pushes a lot of weight around, because he does. That's Gunner Allen Lindblom, former criminal and mafia enforcer. He spent 13 years in prison for extortion, armed robbery, bank robbery, and 17 other capital crimes. He now has his own YouTube channel called My Thing, Tales of a Reformed Gangster, and the author of To Be a King, Volumes 1 and 2. Got A.B. Butler, and I did not get A.B.'s bio in time, but I think he spent close to 30 years incarcerated. We'll hear his story when we get him up. Uh, and he's now obviously a free man working in the music business. And last but not least... And if you check out our thumbnail, he's wearing orange. It looks like a jumpsuit, but he's never served time. But he has been behind bars as a therapist. That is Dr. Roger Rhodes, a senior therapist at the Pace Center in Greenville, South Carolina, specializing in dysfunctional relationships. He worked with inmates inside prisons and knows just about everything uh, going on on the inside. Uh, Larry Levine, I'm going to start with you and I'm going to unmute you momentarily here, but we've got a little bit of breaking news and that is it has become official that uh, Alec Murdoch found guilty last week of murdering his wife and son does intend to appeal his convictions. That is according to documents filed by his legal team just a short time ago. Does this guy stand any chance in hell of winning an appeal? Let me first say that I think less than 1% of defendants in South Carolina who take the stand, who are convicted, ever win an appeal. But what are your thoughts, Larry? He was found guilty by a jury. There's really no question. I mean, there's a little bit of doubt. Maybe he did it. Maybe uh, 0.0001% of doubt. The guy knew he was guilty. He went to trial anyway because he had nothing to lose. And I think he got a better chance of you being knighted by the king right now than him ever winning an appeal anywhere. It's just not going to happen. He was found guilty. I mean, he has time and money to waste. I know a lot of people at all the institutions that I were at, that I was at, they spent their time in the law library just appealing these things, filing paperwork, filing documents. It keeps them busy. And good chance that his lawyer is spoon feeding him bullshit telling him, oh, there's a possibility this or that can happen, and we're going to do this, and the lawyer's just tapping him for money. You can bet that lawyer's getting paid. This lawyer isn't doing it for nothing, but he'll live in a dream for the next few years. The appeals will make its way through the local courts. Then it'll hit the appellate court, maybe the Supreme Court, and it'll get shot down, and boom. He's just there forever. Gunner, to you, um, I wouldn't, and don't take this the wrong way, I wouldn't want to walk into a prison and see you. would make me scared. Um, Alec Murdoch just spent his first night behind bars. Do you recollect your first evening in a prison? What is it like walking into the institution for the first time and hearing the clank of that door slamming behind you? 
Well, I don't, I don't know for sure where they got him. They might have him in PC, but he's he's in quarantine, I imagine, right now. Yeah. So yeah. quarantine is not typically exactly like the, all the all the prisons. The quarantine I went to was very old school. It's one of the oldest prisons in North America, at Jackson, Michigan, and it's just like out of the movies, you know, like a Green Mile type. Just it's just tiers, four tiers, with barred cells. You know, from one end to the other, we're talking like 250 yards. Just, just you know, I don't, I don't know how many cells, maybe 100 per floor or something, but a lot. So when you walk into that environment at first, and everybody's locked down, and just you're looking at the people you're going to be around. It's, I was scared. I'm not going to lie. Walking into prison, and you know, I'm a bigger guy and a dude. Uh, like, I may look big, but I'm much tougher than I look. So I was a tough guy in the streets. All I did is fight and brawl out and knock people out and. I've been stabbed and shot, hit in the head with bats. I go on and on. So I'm a pretty tough guy, scary guy. But you walk in this environment, and I'm a smart guy too. So what happens in that when you get in that environment? These are people around you that aren't mentally all there. That's the problem. They're not. So they just because I was a badass in the street doesn't mean much to some of these guys who are in prison for murder, life and murder, 20, 30 years, sociopaths, really. So now you're walking into a lion's den surrounded by sociopaths. And if you're just like square like this dude, you're terrified. You're terrified because there are – the thing is the, there's predators in prison, and they're seeing – they're looking dead at this guy and can see he's scared and terrified. Like me, it was like, hey, if you walk up on me, I'm going to break your jaw, and then we can stab or fight or do whatever the consequences are. <laughs> Don't mess with me. I won't bother you. That, and I projected that image, and nobody ever did. Nobody bothered me. This guy's walking in there like a young doe surrounded by a pack of wolves. You know what I'm saying? He, he looks scared. And that's going to get uh, perceived almost immediately. I mean, as soon as he goes, to AB can tell you, he's, he's going to be extorted. They're already on him. They're already but, going, this guy freaking, he's weakly. He's so, weakly. Gunner, this guy uh, is a heavy drinker, opioid addict. He's six sure, foot he's, four. Yeah. He's, not a, he's not a small dude. I mean, he is six four. He played college football a little bit. Does that matter in a system like that? Yeah. Or are they going to eat him alive? Still? It does matter a lot because that's just the, the, the nature of the beast, the nature of predatory behavior. If a bu- if there's a buck, you know, and he's still got a big rack and a big body, a lot of the younger bucks aren't going to mess with him. He might be a total pussy. He may be old and busted up. They won't bother him because he looks like he could defend himself. But some, this takes it to another level, and it'll take several days where the predators are going to they're going to watch every move he makes because that's what you do in prison. You watch every move everybody makes, and they're watching you too. And if you if you exhibit you know like prey behavior, weakness. Uh, then the predators will come. My guess would be it could come in the next couple of days. It could come in the next couple of months. Someone is going to say, hey, man, you know what I'm saying? You're locking down my compound. You're going to have to pay up. Stay here. That's it. Otherwise, lock up or, or you get stabbed up. What's your we're choice? Gonna, we're going to get into the specifics. Um, A.B., uh, first, do me a favor. Tell you got to unmute yourself there. But tell SDS Nation, what did you do time for? How long? And if you come in here, uh, talks about how inmates are going to be in line for his lawyer skills. He's a lawyer. Uh, he won't get his usual fees. Uh, what were you in for, though? Let's start there. I was in for um, cocaine. For a lot of years, though. Yeah, I did. I did. I did some decades, man. Some decades, you know. But with the guy that, you know, the hard part is when he going to go hard on him so hard, because he killed this kid, you know what I mean? And, you know, most of the time, a lot of guys in prison take the kids a little serious. And, and, um, and A.B., it, what about the fact that not only is a kid, it was his own son? Does that make it worse? Yeah, you know, that. You know that's, that's a kid, you know what I mean? Even though that's his own son, but, you know, it's, 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 it's touchy, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, bunch of guys in prison probably could understand the woman because they might have said she did this, she nagged him, and, and it, it could be other things. But that kid, his kid is a touchy situation, you know. And, um, yeah, he going to have problems because, first of all, in the eyes of the institutional, he coming in as a rock star. And like my brother said, Everybody going to look at him like he's staking eggs. Mm. So they definitely going to be there watching him, lining him up. And they they are going to definitely press him. It don't matter 
he inside the whole lockdown, 24 hours. You got inmates that work the details. It don't matter. He's going to get pressed either way. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's nothing he could do. It don't matter. You got dudes that don't really care how big he is. You know, they're going to yeah. definitely take advantage of his legal situation. And they look at he got money. So he definitely going to have a lot of problems on his hand. And then on top of that, he appealing his case and he's never been in that situation before. So he really, really got to be careful who he talking to inside. Because you never know who you're talking to trying to come home off of him. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, to you, um, you counsel people. Um, you're a therapist and you've worked inside of prisons. What advice would you be giving Alec Murdoch right now uh, if he came to you and said, hey, Dr. Rhodes, I'm scared for my life. I'm scared to death in here. Scariest place I've ever been. What would you say to him? Keep your head low. You know, one of the things we're going to find out about Alex is they said he was connected to the drug trade. Uh, one of the things all the guests are saying, which I love, is uh, the prison people are going to size him up. And we're going to find out the real Murdoch in this situation. Because if he's connected, we're going to find out about that. Uh, I like the he's a rock star. Yeah, he's just been, he's in, he's a he's a Netflix star. But uh, that's not going to mean much in prison. So uh, I'd, I'd be telling him, keep your head down low, uh, keep your mouth shut. And uh, if, it, if you can get out, get out. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Uh, Larry, back to you. Before we get cracking here, let me tell you what's going on, because uh, Gunner alluded to it. Um, he is having both physical and mental evaluations, and he's been separated from other prison inmates because he is so profile. Right now, he is in a single cement cell in the most secure area of Kirkland Correctional Institution in Columbia, South Carolina, and is currently around uh, the clock. He is under surveillance from prison officials. Uh, he is not allowed to leave the cell without a guard escorting him. Walk us through that right now. What's it like to be confined in that way? You're brand new to the prison system. Uh, you can't really have contact with anybody else. What's going through his head right now? Well, he's in PC. He's in protective custody. And the really probably the only people that could come see him is maybe clergy, possibly his lawyer, and maybe a prison doctor. But he's being classified. Maybe they've given him a Bible to occupy his time. He might have a, a legal pad and a small little pencil like you get at a miniature golf course or something. But uh, they're concerned. They need to classify him that he might try to kill himself. Good chance he's wearing a paper mache jumpsuit. And they're watching him. The inmates in a lot of these places are the ones that watch people that are PC, protective custody, through like a plexiglass window because he is high profile. And if something happens to him, it's going to lead to serious problems down the road. And as the other two former inmates said, people are going to size him up. He may possibly be in protective custody for the rest of his life. But then on the other hand, he does have money. You know, he could be a pussy. Who knows? He's not really a tough guy. I mean, what, he killed his wife and his son with a gun? Anybody could do that. Any of us could whack somebody. But he's going to need to step up and stand up for himself if he wants to get any kind of respect in the system. Because right now, he's just another asshole that's come inside, that committed a crime, and... He is going to be like meat for the inmates. Everyone's going to want to reach into his pocket, take advantage of him and get his money. And he's probably replaying in his mind his life. It's almost like a slow motion video. What led him to be there? But then on the other hand, he's in denial of everything. Maybe he thinks he really didn't kill his wife and son. I mean, who really knows? Wow. Fascinating. Uh, Gunner, to you, um, 
you mentioned uh, having to pay. Um, what kind of fee do you have to pay for protection in uh, in a prison system if you're a guy like Alec Murdoch? He's the fourth generation attorney. His family's basically run that county. I got money. Yeah, what does he have? What does he have to pay, uh, and how I mean, often? You know, I'll give you a quick example. When I first got to prison, I was in level four, and uh, which is you're locked down like 22 hours a day. They put me in there with a rapist. I still remember his name, Robert Morello. And basically, I I kind of slapped him around in the cell, had choked him out, and then had him on the ground like this. I, I finished the job. I said, "You're going to pay me 25 bucks a week to lock in this prison as long as." I'm here. You got to pay me 25 bucks. He, he tried not, you know, kind of say, ah, oh, and I choked him up again. Anyways, he sent me for like a year, 25 bucks. However, I'm just a lone guy, you know, from the street, tough guy. You know, I had some mob connections. Yes. But if he's in, that means nothing in prison. If this guy goes in prison. He's just two. He got two options. One, he's going to fight. He's going to have to fight. He's going to probably have to, if he can fight at all, if he has any little, you know, man in him and he fights, he might be able to not get extorted, but he'll probably have to stab too. Now, so what will happen is where I was, there would be a black gang like the Mobites or the, uh, you know, the, the Nation of Islam. And there'd be some dude, you know, some some big black dude who's hungry, you know, get some money. And he'll go over there and tell him, I'm going to kill you if you don't pay me 100 bucks a month or send my people 500 bucks a month or whatever. And he's got the option to either go tell the cops and tell them he's a known rat. Um, and then they, he locks up anyways, then they put him in the hole and then they transfer him to another prison maybe, or they, you know, I, I can't go back in the yard because they're threatening to kill me. So now they put an order out wherever he goes, these guys got, you know, their organization got people hitters. So, Oh, he, he's in this joint now. All right. Send so-and-so word to get this mother effer on the compound, either squeeze them or freaking or, or stab him up and they'll, they'll catch up with him. It won't take him long. You know, he could leave one day. Two days later, be getting extorted by the guy's same crew from the other joint. So, if someone with money like that, I would, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised at a five hundred dollar a month shakedown, you know, from, from from the guys. That would be adequate. That's what I think and, they're gonna do. And what are they doing with those five hundred bucks? Buying uh, Kit Kats and Reese's at the commissary, or what? All depends, man. Some guys send money home to their girls and to pay for their kids and their families. Um, some people, most guys in that case would probably buy drugs with it or buy it, get, use it to buy and sell drugs, find a way to make some more money. So you get a dirty cop on the line and you pay, and you pay the dirty cop, you know, 2000 bucks a month to bring you in a package, but you freaking this package is enough for you to make, you know, 10,000 bucks on it. Then you send the money home to your family and eat like a king and, you know, whatever that always leads to getting busted though. Like everybody gets busted eventually. It's just a matter of time. One of the junkies that you're dealing with will tell on you. And then that guy will tell him where he got it. And they'll look at the cameras and see who's dealing with what. And they'll figure it out. And they'll realize it's a dirty cop, you know, bust them or, or at least catch the guy. But in the meantime, you know, yeah, they're either eating Kit Kats and Zoom Zooms and Wham Whams or, or they're sending some money home. And guys do. AB, to you, uh, this comment, there was a similar comment before, and I'll have you unmute yourself here. Uh, would being a lawyer protect him since he could be useful for helping out people with their cases? What do you think of that, AB? At the end of the day, he could be a lawyer, he could be an R&B singer, he could be an actor. They don't care nothing about that. It's all about the money. They don't care. Yeah, he could. He going to help them, try to get them out. But at the end of the day, it, they don't they don't care about none of that. They see dollars because, you know, you got to look at it this way. None of them going home. So they don't they don't have nothing to lose. So they just see dollar signs. In it, and it's like they definitely going to put the pressure on them. You know, it don't matter here. PC, they could get them because you got to remember dealing with the feds, the feds process your paperwork. Dealing with the state, the inmates process they process um your paperwork. So at the end of the day, it don't matter what you're gonna do, you're gonna have to deal with the inmates. It don't it don't matter. You can't you can't get around it. If they really want to get to you, and like my brother said, money talk, bullshit walk. So he definitely gonna be cutting some checks. Roger to you, uh Dr. Rhodes. Um, is there a hope that, uh, 
he can be reformed in prison. I mean, guy's spending the rest of his life there. Uh, I, I, I don't, don't know about reformed, but conformed is really what you're saying. You know, he he's going to have to live in that culture and he's going to have to adapt to that culture. And like you've heard from the guests here, you know, uh, what really matters to the people that are inside. And he's really going to have to conform to that. He's used to being influential and, you know, having his will done all, all day long where he used to live and how he used to live. And now it's all about how deep his pocket and, how does he keep, keep some and give some? Larry, what about this question from Pugsley, who's a friend of the show? Uh, he's in jail for life. What percentage of the prisoners are in there for life? I know you might not know about Kirkland specifically, but roughly what percentage of prisoners in a state prison are lifers? Well, it really depends on the custody and security level of the institution. Remember, He's in a classification center right now. So you've got people of all different custody levels. But when he gets into a high security facility, there's a real, real good chance that he could be there. Shit, 50, 60 percent of the people can be doing life and maybe the other 40 percent are doing 100 year sentences. So he's going to be locked up basically with people that are never, ever, ever getting out. And as he, as the doctor said, as far as conforming, he's going to have to get a routine down, a daily routine, and put it all together. Maybe he'll have a job, some kind of stupid job, but that's if he gets out of PC, because he'll be a target. They may leave him in protective custody forever, and then he will have to pay tax and cut a check if they let him out. Larry, hold on one sec. What does that mean, protective cut? Does that mean he would spend the rest of his life essentially in solitary? Well, they could put him in a PC unit where there's a bunch of people, maybe a dozen people that are like rats and informers, possibly child molesters, where they put him in protective custody because they know if they hit the inmate population, they can be killed, they can be assaulted, they could be blackmailed, it could really be anything. I don't see him going into general population anywhere at any time because he is a target, number one target. But then again, who knows what the future holds? Somebody else may come along that does something that'll be even a bigger target than him. I spent 10 years in 11 different federal facilities, all the custody levels. And what's news this week, a month from now, a month from now could be old news. Somebody new comes in with new issues. It's like everybody wants to get the informers, the rats. They're the ones that have the biggest problem, along with the chomos, the child molesters. Nobody respects them. And it's the cops. I mean, a lot of times these people come in, they say they're there for financial fraud, but they don't know anything about fraud. Turns out they're there. I was locked up with a guy that was a Boy Scout leader. He was talking about giving the Boy Scouts his... Uh, mountain man meal but nobody really knew it's the cops a lot of times that tell the inmates what the chomos are in there for and what the rats are in there for because they want to assault them themselves and they can't do it so they know the inmates will finish the job larry why did they move you so many times in 11 11 prisons did you say in 10 years or the other way around but why did they move 11 you so different, much different uh, all the custody levels they were a little pissed off at me doing legal work for people, getting people furloughs, medical care, early releases, getting people into the drug program. They didn't like that at all. They actually tried to release me six months early at the end of my bit just to get rid of me. I caused them to move hundreds of inmates all over the country. And I told them, I'm not leaving. I'm staying and I am going to fuck you people right to the last minute. And I'm going to tell you step by step how I'm doing it. And there's nothing at all you can do to stop me. Nothing at all. And I did. And they moved all these people around because of me, which really fucking pissed them off. I filed the other inmates will know what this is. You may know. I filed a class action habeas, a 2241 on behalf of everybody. And that caused a lot of waves all the way up to Washington. But, you know, it wasn't a money issue. I wanted to get the people moved, and I got what I was looking for. 
And Larry, you're not a lawyer, right? I'm worse than a lawyer. I was like a jailhouse litigator. <laughs> People ask me why I don't become a lawyer. And I go, well, first off, I'd have to have ethics. Second, who regulates what I do as a custody advisor and prison consultant? Nobody. You know, and I don't bullshit my clients. If I don't know the answer to something, I'll just fucking tell them I don't know. But I'll find the answer out, and that's what's important. You got a lot of other prison consultants that spent, shit, 18 months in a camp somewhere, think they know all about prisons, and they really don't, and they're masquerading because they're trying to help people, but they have no idea how the federal system really works or what they're talking about. It's sad. Hey, Gunner, to you, first question, you think you would have been friends with Larry Levine uh, behind bars with this, this guy? You, you think you'd get along? No, no, no. I, I was like him on a diesel therapy a little bit. I did eight or nine prisons over 13 years. So same thing. You piss them off, they ship you around. That I would never be friends with that guy. I, I First of all, I didn't make friends easily in prison. I, I didn't – everybody's a scumbag. Everybody's out for themselves. You can't trust anyone. So – over my years in prison, 13 years in prison, I made three friends. One was a black pimp from Chicago. He's still my boy. He just got out after 19 years. The other dude was a kid. He was just like some kind of hick-ass kid, but I liked him because he liked fishing and hunting. And the other kid was my bunkie and a good dude, and I kind of mentored him. And when, he, when we got out of prison, almost a couple weeks apart, I got him a job, a pretty good job making like 90 grand a year right out of prison. And the guy's been there for six years and, and and only missed like two days. So my point is I didn't make friends easy. Those are the only friends I made in prison over 13 years. But I would have probably, I wouldn't say I wouldn't be open to making a friend, but the first thing I would ask is what are you in for? And if you came up with a sh shady answer of like, oh, they say I killed my, my wife and son, I'd be like, yeah, we're good, bro. You know what I'm saying? You ain't got to say nothing to me. And I'd walk away, and I'd never be his friend. And nobody would. He can, he'd lie. Maybe I'd believe it and say, oh, I'm in here for this, that. But it tends to, you tend to find out. Inmates will find out. One day, my goes, you know what your bunk is in here for? That dude. I'm like, no, nah, what? He's like, man, he's a rapist. Or he's just a, and if, if I've never had, I did have a, a, I had a rapist in my cell, and I actually made them move me out. And I told them, I went to the, the, the counselor. I said, you got to move me out of the cell right now. I found out he was a rapist. And she says, why? What's the problem? I said, I can't, I can't tell you that. But you got to go. It's, it's, you have to move me right now. Otherwise, someone's going to get hurt. It ain't going to be me. She kind of looked at me and was like, all right. And she moved me. But um, it was, but anyways, that guy's got a lot of that to deal with over the next however many years. You know, he's going to be meeting a lot of people and they ain't going to like them. They're not going to want to be here. You kill your wife and kid, man. Like I said, that's the dirtiest of the dirty. That's in there with chomo rapist, you know, and pedophile. That, that's it. You killed your own family, bro. Nobody's going to want to be friends with this guy. So he's going to have to either learn to boss up and be tough and hold his head. Cause I knew a couple guys like that. They're like that. They were freaking in there for that kind of case. And they just, they, you know, they fight and stab and whatever. And people pretty much left them alone because of it. But I have a feeling this guy's not like that. He's soft as hell, so they're probably going to freaking, you know, they're cut into him. Gunner, quick. can they get to you in protective custody if they want to? They can get to you in protective custody in certain ways. Like, if you're in legit PC, nobody can really get to you, but the cops can, and you can manipulate the cops. You see what I'm saying? Don't feed them. Don't let them out for a shower. Don't cut his phone time off. Blah, blah, blah. I like, don't let him his way, but... You know, once they're in the, they get one of those PCU. I don't think he'll end up in a PC unit, though. I, I have a feeling that after some years, uh, just like he said, I think it was the doctor said it. They, they, they people will forget about. Him. So he'll, you know, one day he'll hit the yard, and you know, maybe they won't bother him. You know, what I'm saying because his case is old, nobody gives a shit. He's at a new joint, blah blah blah. But I think when he's going to have the same problem every time. As soon as he starts getting out there, people start learning who he is. They're going to come at him. And uh, he'll either have to lock up and go back to PC or, or fight. That's it. And by the way, guys, Gunner has written a book called To Be a King, two volumes, one and two. If you want more stories like this, you got to get the book. Um, A.B., to you. Oh, hang on one sec. Go ahead there, Gunner. Well, uh, that was saying, by the way, you got my YouTube wrong list. So, so the series that I do on my YouTube wrong is called My Thing, Tales the Form Gangster. But my, my YouTube channel is Gunner Detroit. So if you want to check out. I, I just share some crazy ass stories from my life. So Gunner Detroit. Gunner Detroit, guys. G U N N E R. Gunner Detroit. Yeah. A B to you. 
Walk me through a day right now for Alec Murdoch from morning to night. How does the day start? What time? How does it start? What's he doing? Well, I, I, I don't know how his day started, but mine started as, you know, I wake up, go to the chow hall, give me some breakfast. Then, you know, I start my, you know, they gave me a detail. I was like the New York sanitation man, so... I had my crew, we went and picked the trash up around the whole compound. And half, and then the other half, I go work out, you know, because I was a pull-up monster, a dip monster, you know what I mean? So I play myself in the gym, go work, and then I go in the education department and, and um, you know, just mind my business. I get on the phone and talk to some of my Rest in peace to a lot of my celebrity friends. You know, I used to call, get on the phone, talk to DMX, Warren G, my cousin Chris Lighty. You know, I used to talk to everybody, you know, just to kill the time. But when when the guy said that he was got transferred to 11 joints, me too, I was on tour. I used to tell my family, they was like, where you at? I said, I'm on tour. I'm in Yazoo, Mississippi. I'm in Petersburg, Virginia. I'm in McKean, Pennsylvania. I'm in Atlanta Penitentiary. I'm in El Reno, Oklahoma. And, you know, it broke the time up. You know what I mean? How did and, they move you from, like, you take a bus? How did they move you around? No, I was on I was on a bus, and then I was on a plane. They have a plane. When I tell you, that plane is no joke, because when I left, when I left um, Atlanta and went to Asheville, they put a black box on me. Then from when I got to Asheville, got to Alabama, got into it with the AW because he he thought that he was the boss and he knew everything. So they got me out of there from Alabama. They put me put the black box on and I went to Yazoo, Mississippi. So I've been on, I understand it. They call it, what they call it? The, um, therapy, diesel therapy. That's what they used to call it. But I didn't mind because everywhere I went to, I had a visit. So, you know, they couldn't really break me because the, the government couldn't break me. So why would I let the institutional break me? Dr. Rhodes, back to you here. Um, so he's undergoing physical and mental health evaluations. You're a mental health practitioner. You're a therapist. Take us into that world. How do they evaluate his mental health? Some might say he's a sociopath, a narcissist. At the end of the day, he's a convicted killer. But what are they doing to test his mental health in there? Well, they're making it uneasy. You know, if, if there's a, st uh, a, a set schedule then he's going to figure that out and do it. But but one of the things that's important to understand is that culture, whatever culture, whatever place people go, there's a culture. And if people get into it and understand it and work with it, they get a, get they do better there. But it's a, it's a doggy dog environment. And he's got to figure out what dog is he. And if he's not a good dog, then it's not going to be a pretty sight for him. And uh, certainly since he's high profile right now, they're going to work at keeping him separate and keeping him safe. And that, but that is going to over time mess with his head. You know, that, that uh, I used to be out. I used, and his hardest thing being a narcissist is he used to be somebody and now he is nobody. You know, and that he he could go anywhere and do anything and shoot anybody, but today he he better look out or it's going to be him that's been got. So he he's got to be much more aware of what he does, who he talks to, how he get, he's got to he's really got to lead centrally a paranoid lifestyle. They say that uh, public speaking is the number one fear. My number one fear is winding up in prison and having to deal with a guy like Gunner. I'm, Larry, I'll be back to you in a moment. Gunner's time is limited tonight, and uh, he's kind enough to join us. Gunner, this question here from Blue Jays, what was the first thing you did when you got out of prison? Uh, if it's not X-rated, you can share it. 
Uh, well, you know, most people don't know my story. I have a really remarkable story. Um, I wish do I could tell, tell you. Do tell. I, I, well, there's a TV series being made, and I'm not under a gag order, so I can't really talk about it. But true, true story with Armand DeSante, believe it or not. But I had a love story that was crazy. My wife found me when I was in prison. <clears throat> Six years ago, I was in prison. My friend started a Facebook page for me and put on there. I was writing books in prison and that I was a Christian. And this random chick saw on there uh, that I was a Christian and she was a new Christian and that I was writing. Well, she worked for a publisher and she was a huge, huge reader. Huge. So she sent me a JPay, which is a prison email, and said, you know, I work for a publisher and some friends in commercial publishing, um, um, commercial fiction. You know, I'd be willing to check out your manuscript, whatever. We started writing for like about a month and a half, kind of got to know each other and had a lot of a lot of, in common. And then I sent her the manuscript of the book and she read the book and was blown away. And she said it was the best book she ever read. And she was a huge reader. She'd been a huge reader since she was four. That's a whole long story, too. But she had a literary scholarship the whole night. Anyway, so we ended up falling in love with, with each other through love letters over about a year back and forth writing. And then it came to the point where just we knew we were in love with each other. So she waited seven years for me, or six and a half. <clears throat> she waited like six and a half years. Um, got us a house. She said, where do you want to live? I said, up north in the wilderness, away from people, away from the noise. I'm stuck around people for 13 years. I want to kill people every day. I want to go somewhere where I can have peace and quiet, a little four-wheeling, ride my bike, whatever. So she got us a place and went and waited, you know, six six years for me uh, in the wilderness to come home. So the day that I get out, I had four of my my homeboys, four of my buddies, <clears throat> were waiting at the at the uh, gate when they when they opened the door. I come walking out with this footlocker, and uh, it was a big hugs and very emotional moment. They had it on Facebook Live. I think there was like eighteen hundred people watching it on Facebook Live. Me walking out of prison after thirteen years, and then they took me to get breakfast. I had a breakfast. They gave me some gifts. I got an iPhone. And then I had them drop. My wife was uh, five hours north preparing this big feast for us. That's where we we're going to live. So two of my boys, you know, I hugged, said what's up to my boys, got in the car with my other two buddies. I actually pulled out of the parking lot in a brand new 2016 Hellcat that was with a sticker in the window sideways. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I got a picture of a, my first selfie ever. First one ever. At, there's the, the sign, the prison sign, me and my boy right there in a Hellcat as we pulled out. So I went and ate like a pig at Bob Evans, and then uh, they drove me five hours north to meet my wife, who wasn't my wife yet. She was still my fiance. And I went home, and it was a very emotional moment. They, I surprised her because we lived in the middle of nowhere, no other houses around. So I said, pass the house, let me out. I'm going to sneak through the woods and just like, open the door and surprise her, try to mess with her. Um, she knew we were on our way. She just didn't know the exact time we'd be there. She's super nervous. I mean, she's been cooking all day. It's like 95 degrees. She's cooking this feast all day long. She's sweating. She, anyway, she was out on the bed. I, they, she heard a car go by, but didn't stop. So it wasn't us. Well, they drove down the road a couple hundred yards and let me out. And I snuck through the woods, creeping through. And she had a little bit of music playing in the house, just like, you know, maybe Christian rock or something. I don't know what it was. And she didn't hear me. I, she was sitting on the back deck in a blue dress, praying. Because I, I asked her, what are you doing? She's like, I was praying. And uh, what are you praying for? And she's like, that you don't ever go back and then you stay with me forever and you love me, you know, whatever. Anyways, I come sneaking up. I call her Birdie. I said, what's up, Birdie? And she jumps up. Oh, my God. And, of course, we had a very emotional hug. And, and then I spent about five minutes hugging and kissing. And then my boys come walking out videoing it. So that to answer the question, that's the first thing that I did when I got out of prison that was it. The first couple of hours, I did go see my dad too because I hadn't seen my dad in 15 years. So, because I had a big blowout with him before prison, I hadn't seen him in two years. But then I saw him on the way up, and then after that, I got married the next day. So just to end it with that, the next day at four o'clock in the morning, I hit the gym with my cousin. And after that, I took a shower. We went to the courthouse, and got, they were my boys were the witnesses. I got married to this girl, and then. I went to a couple miles down the road in the middle of the wilderness, this beautiful remote wilderness beach on uh, Long Lake Huron, and I had my cousin baptize me. So he baptized me in the, in the waters of Lake Huron, and I just wanted to start fresh, and that was my way of doing it. And so that's then I began my life. <laughs> the doctor's shaking his head. Happy to hear that. Good thing uh, hopefully your wife is not watching, because Lauren R. says, Gunner, are you single? Asking for a friend. Gunner still got it, man, after all those years in the clink. Uh, Larry, to you. Um, someone had asked, and I'm curious about your thoughts on this. Is he the type of guy that you think will try to take his own life facing the prospect of never seeing the light of day again? 
I think the guy's a chicken shit. And I don't really think that he's going to do that. He'll adapt to the prison system. He's too much of a narcissist. He's looking for attention. And if he takes himself out, he is going to lose that attention. And that's not what he wants. You know, in some aspects, I don't want to bring up politics. I'm not really political. When the doctor was describing Murdoch, in some aspects, it sounded like he was describing Donald Trump as far as the mannerisms and how he wants people to view him and such. But taking himself out, I suppose it could happen, but I don't think it's likely. Not at all. And uh, while I have you, Larry, this is an interesting question. I'm going to shoot to all you guys from Andrea. Love your channel. This is a slight detour, but I'm curious. Can you ask them if they think uh, Jeffrey Epstein killed himself in prison? What do you think, Larry? I think it was, you know what? This is interesting. Three days after the guy got arrested, I put on my Facebook page, he'll never get out of there alive before he can testify. And if you don't understand that, you don't know how shit really works in America. Well, everything happened exactly as I said. Fox News even put my Facebook page on the air and they read it for everybody. The fix was in. I mean, he's in PC. He's in a detention center in New York. They're supposed to do rounds, I don't know, every 30 minutes or something. They're supposed to have cameras watching the cell block. Now, all of a sudden, very conveniently, the cameras didn't work. Nobody went around and checked anybody. And it turns out the cops were sitting in their little office watching porn on their cell phones or they were asleep. Does this sound logical to you or to anybody? I think it's complete bullshit. These people were paid off that worked for the BOP. I mean, what did they get hit with? A misdemeanor charge? They don't work for them anymore. Somebody came in and got to them. For all we know, it could have been a member of the royal family. Look at it like this. If Trump wanted to get to him or the Clintons, everybody said it was all political. They could have got to him anytime. They wouldn't have to wait until he was in a high security unit. So it doesn't make sense. It was somebody else that he blackmailed or had dirt on him. And I think that eventually will come out. But you don't think he did it to himself. Someone did it no. to him. You know, I examined all these photos for other networks. And if you look at his PC cell, because remember, they took him out of PC. They threw his ass in a psych unit for so long. Then they brought him back. Well, he had only been there a few days before he ended up dead. Do you remember those pictures of the cell that had jumpsuits and just all this crap in it? It looked like a garbage dump. When somebody leaves a PC cell, they have inmates that have a detail. They clean that cell out. I don't want to say it's pristine, but they take everything out of the cell. This guy gets there three days later. It looks like he fucked and lived in there for a year or something. So I don't buy it at all. I think the fix is in and... Epstein got what was coming to him. Sometimes that is the harsh reality. AB, back to you. Um, this question from Catherine S. Uh, because of his age, he's 53, 54 years old. Would he be housed with an older population? Do they break it up that way, AB? Uh, uh, AB? No, nah, they, they, they don't go on your age. They don't care how old you are. You know what I mean? They could put you in... You 53 years old, they could put you in a cell with a 25-year-old, a 20, a 21-year-old. It don't matter. You know what I mean? It's just that if they put him in a cell, only way he'll get the bottom bunk, if he go to the hospital and say he got back problems, he got knee problems, he can't get on the top bed. But rather than that, there's no age. You know what I mean? They definitely going to put you with whoever that room is open. That's where they're going to put you. You know, and with the first, the other question you just asked my guy, he didn't kill himself. Somebody came in there and hung him. You know what I mean? It's just like the same way they did for the NBA player, too. He didn't hang himself. Why? You know, at the end of the day, you powerful, don't matter. You powerful in jail, you powerful on the streets. Why would you want to take your life? You know what I mean? Because it, it was just going to be a matter of time 
They sent the hitman in there. A hitman was an inmate. They covered all that up. Yeah, they killed him. The, the guys who know are breaking news on STS right now saying that Epstein did not hang himself. Uh, AB, Demet says, want to hear more from AB. No BS from him. So let me ask you this question. How would I do in prison, AB? Would I even make it? Well, it, it, I tell anybody, you can't take nothing away from a person. It's all about how you carry yourself, how you bring yourself in there. I tell anybody, when you go to prison, you got to look at a dog. If you see a rock wall out there looking at you, if you play scared, he's going to attack. It's how you carry yourself. You know what I mean? If you go in there acting like you're a gangster, you're hard, somebody want to test you. Because you got everybody in there, you got everybody in prison, it's the same people that you was dealing with on the street, with the attitudes, the personalities. That's the same thing you're going to deal with in the prison. And most of the time, dudes get caught up in prison. It'd be over the phone, homosexual, gambling, TV. AB, speaking truth. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, to you, um, it was kind of interesting. Someone said, um, and now I'm having a senior moment myself, about uh, Alec Murdoch in that joint. Um it will come back to me. It's been a long few weeks here, but Dick Harputlian came out today, the former criminal defense attorney, and says that Alec is already receiving hate mail uh, in, in prison, calling him, and he quotes now, a piece of scum, hoping that he dies of rectal cancer. Emotionally, what is he going through right now? I remember my question. And also, is he in denial? I think Larry mentioned this. Do you think there is a part of him that has convinced himself that he didn't really do this? Yeah, he, he did that before he killed him. Uh, that That's, I mean. Explain that. Explain that. Well, I think that people have the ability to create in their head their own reality and run it through their brain so many times that it becomes their reality. And you can, you can hook, hook them up to a lie detector and they could be telling a lie, but they've convinced themselves it's the truth. That's where my, my, uh, Alec is. And, you know, he has, again, he has to assess wh where he fits. How is he going to get into the wherever he is? And they have a lot invested in keeping him safe right now. So whatever they have to do, their, their, their jobs, their livelihood, their fair, all that is on the line with this. And he's, he is a, even though he's, he's been uh, convicted and guilty, he's still a connected attorney in the state of South Carolina. That, that didn't stop when he, he was convicted. So, uh, He's going to try to milk the system, and the system's going to try to milk him. And uh, a couple of things I want to share that while the mic's been off, Don't just worry. a minute ago, we heard the true, genuine American love story about getting out of prison, marrying somebody, going to the woods. That I hope our listeners and, and viewers listen to this. This is real love. This is what love sounds like. You know, this is not Hollywood. It's got all the, the you know, the big orchestra and the, you know, all the stuff going. No, it's about a guy sneaking in the woods to get to his girl. I love that. I love that story. That was a great story. And, in and Dr. Raj, world, let, let me ask you one more question. What about these guys? The fact that they're out here, they're doing this interview, they're very articulate. Seems like they all have their act together. Um, is there hope in this world that you can turn things around? Are these guys living examples of that? They are. They are. Wait a minute. I mean, it, it's how it's knowing what you can put up with and what you can't put up with. You know, do I can I imagine a place? 
where I want to be the person I am. And if you create that place, you're going to be a happy camper. And, and this is a great example of people who find their, you know, the three men we're talking to have found their niche. Are they any, the only thing they have in common is they've all been to prison, but they have different niches and they're very successful in the new niche. That That's, you know, what people should take away from this. Wherever you are, whatever prison you've created, you don't have to stay there. You can, you can be something else. Gunner, back to you, this question here, Gunner. Um, knowing what we do about Alec, how will he get along with prison guards uh, and officials? That's one question. And the other question right here, Janice wants to know, what kind of food is he eating every day? All right. So but I want to answer that, say one more thing that a doctor, he's a fan of this love story. And this story is, it, it, no matter what the, the, the teaser that I teased in there, it's, it, there's so much more to it. Like I was born in the mafia family, like born in and raised up and around it. And I, all this time as a kid, I kind of had this gift as a writer. But anyway, so I'll, when, the, when, when the story comes out, I'll, I, I hope you watch it. But what kind of, without the, you want to know how he's going to get along with the, um, with the CEO. corrections officers. And by the way, I'll have you back on with Roger, Dr. Raj, and we'll go through your book. Yeah, okay. I appreciate that. I'd love to do that. Now, my book is a fiction novel, but um, but the, the story he's talking about is my real life. Yep. And there's, like I said, there's a lot more to it that I can't say right now because of this obligation. But when I can, I will. Um, but, our, you know, Armand Asante is in it, so that's pretty cool. So I think he's one of those guys who will certainly – um, warm up to the COs. Will COs warm up to him? Probably not. Some might. Some might do him favors. If you, you know, he might be able to bribe a guy to get him a cell phone. Um, you know, that's very, very likely. My, my, I imagine he's going to warm up to some CO and be like, "Listen, dude, I'll give you freaking, you know, fifteen hundred bucks if you bring me in this cell phone, you know, and a charger." But I mean, I don't know how how well he'll get along with them. I and mean, a lot of the, lot of the COs can really be d bags, but they also, in one regard, they don't like the perverts and the, and the child murderers and things any more than we do. Like they they hate them too. So they might give his paperwork to some dude he's been chumming around and be like, you know, you might want to read this. This guy you've been playing poker with or and you know playing chess with, and maybe the guy would look. What the fuck? Are you kidding me? Get this freaking guy out of here. Food wise, I think uh, he's in a big for a big shock. But he's been—I imagine he's been in the county jail for some time, right? Yeah, he's in the county jail. Well, what? It, tell us what a meal is like. What are you eating? Oh, I, I um, this county jail food is probably even worse than the, than the prison. But they're both horrible. So it's just very very basic nutrients. And when I first went to prison, you know, I'll be mean like nineteen years ago now. They actually fed you halfway decent, like the food was halfway decent, uh, but then it got worse because they were trying to lower the cost per inmate per meal, and it got to where it's it's like, okay, I'll give you an example. For lunch, you might get a a fake fish fillet breaded, but it's so fake that if you crack it open, you don't even know it's fish. It's like, is this a chicken fillet or is this fish? It has no flavor of fish whatsoever. And then you get like a scoop of peas, frozen peas, beans, and carrots, and two pieces of bread, and a glass of Kool-Aid. You know, that's about, that's about the meal. You might get a cookie or something for dessert. That's it. And, and you know, that's, that's not much to live on. When I I was just telling the story a couple days ago because I posted a video on my YouTube of me. I made a prison cook-up or what we call them prison cook-up or do. And, I, you know, it's the same thing I made in prison, but it's really good. I used chicken. I, I was very blessed that I had um, people who supported me in the street. So I was allowed to buy i had plenty of food and if i, I get a, a plug in the kitchen who would bring me food i pay him i get a dozen eggs from one guy a day vegetables from another guy so i i was a chef in prison i cooked these big elaborate cookups every day and i didn't go in the chow but maybe like three times a week you know for maybe one of the few meals that i liked and i was you know because you, you start eating better and then you try to eat the prison food it's just horrible he'll have money so if he's smart He'll be able to cherry pick a, a guy who works in the kitchen and say, bring me some cheese and some meat. Um, bring me a loaf of bread. Bring me raisins. Bring anything you can, you know, and you just send the money right to his account, you know. But maybe a guy don't want to deal with the guy like him. You know, guy, I'm good, dude. You know, killed your freaking family, man. You should rot in here like a freaking, you know, rot like hell. 
Gunner, what's it smell like in prison? <laughs> like I got to run in a second, but I, that's a great one to end it on. It's uh, <laughs> prison is, and so AB and and I mean Larry's his name. They'll they'll both agree with this. So prison, the county jail smells like bo and like dirty crackheads, you know. Prison typically sm- smells mostly like um, uh, cleaners because you have these guys that are on details all the time, porters, and they're uh, all day, every day. Somebody's mopping and cleaning, and whatever. So it's it's everything smells, you know, very chemically, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can always know if there's say been a blood spill or a fight, you know, from a blood spill and there's in a cell because they use different chemicals. And bleach, and it smells much different. So if you come in from the yard, you smell bleach and these chemicals, you go, oh, you know, somebody got stabbed up because there must have been a bunch of blood. They, they clean up. But it's, it's not a pleasant smell. It's never a pleasant smell in prison. And the worst part, when they put you in a cell with another guy, dude, you can't imagine. Those guys know. These two know. <laughs> but you can't imagine how bad it smells in a cell when two grown men in the hot summer, freaking, you know, you got dirty laundry in a bag sitting on the floor in your locker. This, it just stinks. It just stinks freaking funky. It, it, it's just horrible. Uh, two men in a closet sweating their balls off. Maybe get to shower every other day or something. What, I, like if I had a bunkie who wouldn't shower, I'd, I'd say, I got to move. Like You got to shower every day with me. By the, the way, how do, shower, how do showers work? You go one at a time. You all go together. Is there a place where fights happen? Well, he's going to be in PC. They're going to pull him out of the cell and he'll walk into a shower about three times a week. They'll give it to him. But um, a regular unit, you know, like a level two, level four, you know, like let's say you're in a level four, you get shower time, you know, there's a period, you get out for an hour and a half, like unit time. And during that unit, if you want to shower, you go shower. Um, when you're in level two, there's more time out. You have the key to your own door. You're kind of going out at the end of the showers of the community shower. Um, and yes, it's a lot. Of, it's one of the places fights happen all the time is because it's off camera. So you can go in there and just bang out in there. And, I, you know, I've seen it done a lot of times. I almost got in a couple of fights, but never did. And not in the bathroom. My way, if I was going to fight a guy, I'd follow him into a cell. I'd just bust in on him and, and, and get him. That way it's not on camera. And they can't. But the bathroom is right, not far from the base either. So if you're in there smashing to hang, hang a fight, the base is like, you know, 50 feet away where the cops are. And the COs are sitting there. But, yes, I've seen stabbings in, in the showers and, and rapings happen in the shower. So it's. It's a bad place to be. Well, Gunner, I know you have to go. Appreciate your time. Real quick, plug what you need to plug. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, so if you go to my uh, my uh, my uh, website, Gunner Detroit, like Bang 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 Gunner Detroit, all the links to everything I do is there. My novels, my two novels, To Be a King, Volume One and Two, about a fictional mafia family. Believe it or not, it's um, they people are calling it the next Godfather. Go read the reviews. Just check out the reviews. It's uh, just you know a couple hundred of them, and, and see what people are saying. Other than that, I own Our Thing Apparel, which is a custom apparel company, OurThingApparel.com. On the back, if you look in the back, your your city or state. So well, I'm from Detroit, but we have like, you know 15 designs. You pick your city for wherever you're from, and on the back it'll say your thing, like Detroit Our Thing. And then I have uh, a YouTube channel, Gunner Detroit. So check me out there, and stay tuned for some news. So I'll let you know when I have big news to break. I'll, and I'll I'll say this is the project we're walking working on. In the meantime, I can't really. Speak say much about it for like another month or two but but thank you thank you glad to see you doing well keep it up and uh everyone we've got over five thousand live human beings great time to hit that like button talk to you soon gunner um if you guys can stay on i would appreciate it uh larry to you um hang on one sec gunner i just cut you off there hang on one sec larry I'm sorry. Larry, I, I'd like to get, like, if, if you give me an email, I'd like to talk to you. So I got a couple of things that, you know, I'd like to talk about. To Dr. Rhodes? Larry, this gentleman of the Green Oh, Larry, screen. yeah, I'm going to connect you guys. Don't you worry. We're one happy yeah, family I, right now. I, I have uh, just a couple questions for him. So, and, um, <laughs> but anyways, like I said, doctor, I hope you check out my freaking, uh, this series that's coming out. You're going to love it. But love is real. It can happen. That's, I'll leave you on that. Um, I found love or love found me in prison. Unbelievably, it's seven years left in prison. And this woman miraculously writes me and we literally fall in love through through hundreds of pages of love letters. I actually proposed to her before I ever spoke a word to her on the phone. And she wrote me back one word, yes. And I was like, that's, we're good to go. And then she waited. So God bless, don't give up on love. It can happen. And, um, and go read my books. This is a big, bad mafia enforcer saying that love is the real deal. Thank you, Gunner. Love is the real deal. Uh, Larry, to you, um, 
This comment here from Sheesh says, by the way, Sherry's News writes, Larry is real. No bullshit from Larry. He helps the person going inside to survive. And then this comment from Sheesh, hadn't his family been prosecuting and sending people to prison since they opened? This is a fourth generation. Four generations, yeah. yeah so what about the fact that um, they have been sending a lot of the people that are incarcerated have been sent there by this family? How problematic is that? Well, there's other people that are serving life sentences on the inside. It's kind of like Gunnar said, that they have nothing to lose. These people that are serving, doesn't even have to be life. What if it's 50 years? And this guy's family are the ones that put him there or put them there. Yeah, he does have to worry about that because everyone inside is looking for revenge. They're looking to get even. You know, they're looking to get something on their informants and take care of them. But when you get a prosecutor, was he a prosecutor? He, he himself? He, he For a very short time, but the family were all prosecutors. Okay. They're called solicitors there. Well, yes. there's a good chance this asshole may become collateral damage and they'll go after him. And this is why I believe that he's going to be in a controlled custody unit. He's not really going to go into general population. First off, he killed his wife and his son. Not a popular crime at all. His family was prosecutors. Not a popular crime at all. He's got a lot of money. He still has it. Don't believe what you hear. It makes him a victim. People are going to come after him, and he's going to have to watch his fucking back. I don't care where he is for the rest of his life. Scary as hell. Um, A.B., I'm going to read this. I'm going to unmute you just so you know. Um, this is a notorious prison that he's in right now. Four Kirkland inmates were strangled by two others in a 30-minute killing spree back in 2017. Uh, and prisoners have been known to orchestrate murders from inside their cells. In this case, uh, they lured their victims into their cell with the promise of drugs and cookies. And they asked them the reason they did that. They said that life was such hell in prison they wanted to be put on death row so they could be uh, basically put to death. Um, is this sometimes a mentality inside a prison that people are just so desperate that they'll kill to just try to get themselves killed? Got to unmute yourself. Okay. You got a lot of people that is from, from, the, from the outside world really can't handle pressure. You know what I mean? And it's just that people, when you out here doing good, you burn bridges. That's why I tell anybody, no matter how much money you got, what you're doing in life, always treat people with respect because you never know when it's going to come back to get you. So it's like, yeah, you got a lot of people in, in different situations tired being in that one situ that one spot. So they don't mind going to marry it somewhere where it's a new institution. Of course, once you get to that institution, your mind, your time start all over again because it's a new process at a new prison. There's new rules. Everything is new. So, yeah, you know, he, yeah, it could be that, you know what I mean? They definitely on that time. But his family was a prosecutor. His, his, his family, oh, yeah, he got problems on his hand because in that town, Columbia, South Carolina, and I know where it's at, you know, and I know where the prison at, you know. Um, yeah, he got problems on his hand. A.B., I mean, how about this? Uh, Denisha writes the trial was on TV. Um, does that mean that people inside saw? Of course. Everybody see everything. One thing, let me, let me tell you about prison. Prison get information before y'all get it on the streets. So anything go down in anywhere outside outside world, the prison got it three hours before y'all got it. So it's like it's, it's they know everything. They don't think because they inside prison, they don't know what's going on. They got TVs, yes, they watch the news. They got the magazines, they got the newspapers, so it's a headline, you know what I mean? So, yeah, they got access to everything that goes on in the world 
where people don't realize they think because somebody's behind the fence, behind the wall, they don't know what's going on. You know, everybody got the internet, everybody got cell phones, everybody got this and that. So it's not, you're not hiding. Whatever you do, it's definitely going to come out and they already know. Where you at, where you going, where they going to put you at. AB, let me ask you another question while I have you. There's, there's a weird connection when I'm talking. Hang on a sec. Um, and I'll unmute you in a sec. But he didn't get the death penalty, and some people think he should have. And when you look at the statistics in the state of South Carolina, overwhelmingly uh, black people at a poverty level are the ones who are given the death penalty. Does this have to change, AB? You are the one black man. I don't need to tell you that on this panel. Yeah, a lot of things need to change for the system, you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, you got to look at it this way. Getting the death penalty, putting him to sleep that way, what did you prove? He's not, he's just going so quickly, you know what I mean? No. Being, getting life, that's like being on a death penalty, you know what I mean? He's going to get it either way. He's going to die in there. So let him understand and see over the times of, I don't know how old his kids, his son was, but he need to see if his kid was 17, 16, he need to be inside that prison for 16 years old, missing his son growing to become a man that he created. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Hello? I can't hear you. AB, I'm sorry. That's my fault. I've got you. I've got you. Uh, continue yeah. on. I'm sorry. Yeah, but nah, but you know, that, you know, it definitely, you know, it's sad that, you know, black kids get more time and get punished more for little crimes or even minor crimes, you know what I mean? But it's just, it's just that the justice system got the, it got the, it, it got the, it got to go the right way. It got to like a scale. It got the scale is even, you know what I mean? A lot of things got to change and a lot of people don't understand that, you know, what as being a black man, what we go through, through the court system, through the system period. You know, we get punished even harder for minor things, and it, it got to change. But you know, one day it will. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of injustice in the justice system. Um, Doctor Rhodes, to you, uh, do you want to comment on that? The fact that it's such a disproportional number, a disproportionate number of poor black men being put to death, and a guy like Alec Murdoch did not receive well, the death penalty for a heinous crime? I don't want to bring up the Civil War, uh, but we might as well in this. I mean, uh, it's not, it ha hadn't been that long ago. And so it, it, is it... Dr. Rhodes, like, right on cue there, look at this comment. Right when you say that, Bourne Standen says he was a member of Kappa Alpha fraternity founded by Robert E. Lee. Wait till they see the picture of him in a Confederate uniform. Just to your <laughs> point. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we're not only talking about South, uh, but we're all also talking about low country South. And we're also talking about farmer South. Boy, I'll tell you, man, th th we're, this our Alec Murdoch wasn't a metro man, you know, up in a Northeast city. He, he, was, a, he was down in the country. Low country here in South Carolina. Uh, he came from a culture. Uh, if he certainly was in the fraternity with Robert E. Lee, good. I think that says it all. And uh, do I think th they're going to put him at risk? No, I do not think they're going to put him at risk. Uh, not because of his status, uh, be, but just because it. They don't. They don't want to be under that pressure. If there, if there's anything funky going on, if you don't think Alec Murdoch's not going to let that information out, 
then you're mistaken. You know, he 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 gains by letting everybody know uh, where he is, and he's so full of himself, he's going to be sad if everybody doesn't know what he's doing 24-7. Uh, Larry, to you, how slowly does time move? Does that clock tick in prison? You know, that's the number one question I get from clients. Other than, am I going to be raped in there? And I lower my voice and say, well, maybe the first time it is. But you may enjoy it. After that, it's consensual sex. I just do that to fuck with the people. (laughs) But the days move very slowly. But the weeks and the months, you know, they move very quickly. And before you know it, it's Friday again. It's movie night again. I did 10 years straight all the way through. No bullshit programs. They didn't give me RDAP. I didn't get out early. And sometimes, I mean, this may sound fucking crazy, okay? I tell clients before they go in, you may enjoy it in there. And they look at me like I'm fucking nuts. You may enjoy the downtime. The first time in your life and shit, in years, in decades possibly, you have no real responsibilities. You don't have to really pay bills. Maybe you owe fines or assessments. So that's bullshit. They take a few dollars from you a month. You've got no one calling you on the phone to house. So you're trying to borrow money. You can sleep a good part of the day. They're all bullshit jobs. AB knows this. What is it, AB? 12 cents, 17, 29, and 40 cents an hour. They don't pay you much. But I found prison... You're, you're all going to think I'm crazy. I found prison to be one of the most relaxing experiences <laughs> that I ever went through. I enjoyed the downtime. And people don't believe I'm 61. And I tell them it's because I didn't really age. For me, prison was not a stress-free environment. I mean, it what? was not. For me, prison was a stress-free environment. I found it worthwhile because I was helping people do legal work, helping people get out early. Before I went in, I mean, you went through a laundry list of charges as far as what I was charged with. I also had some ties to organized crime where I was like a troubleshooter for certain organizations where they would bring crime to me and I would make crime better. I was like an efficiency expert for the mob, more bang for the buck. So prison didn't affect me the way it affects other people. I was already used to dealing with shady people, people out on the street. So the time for me was fluid. It just moved on through. Before you knew it, I got out. And you know, you asked before, I guess one of the viewers asked, what was the first thing you did when you got out? First thing I did was go after all those motherfuckers that owed me money, that never paid me and never paid my kid. And I went and collected from every one of them. I even threatened some guy I was going to put his arm in the garbage disposal and throw the switch. Thank God I didn't have to do it. (laughs) Hey, Larry, you're the uh, now the founder and CEO of Wall Street Prison Consultants. Sounds like uh, a company Alec Murdoch might uh, uh, put in his employ. If he contacted you from prison, how would you advise him? I would tell him, first of all, he would not. He's in state prison. I only do federal work. He's never getting out. He's not going to be eligible for any programs. But the best advice I would give him, show some fucking respect. Maybe you'll get some respect back. Don't be a know-it-all. You keep your mouth closed and keep your eyes and your ears open. Do not become confrontational with anyone. Become as polite and respectful as you can. And this is the same advice I give to my clients. You guys need my help. You need you you know someone that's going in. You're going in 8555 prison. That's 8555 prison. It rings on this phone right here. I'll talk to you. I'll give you the straight fucking scoop. Got to love Larry's honesty. Uh Dr. Rhodes, I saw you kind of shaking your head when Larry surprisingly said that he almost enjoyed his experience because there was Little to no responsibility. I did see a comment that I could relate to saying the best part is you wouldn't have to pay any bills. There is a lot of stress as well in the outside world. What did you make of Larry's comment? Hang on a second. Larry, go ahead. I had a prison psychiatrist, not psychologist, Uh 
say that I treated the federal prison system like it was my own personal adult amusement park. And I was just having too good of a time in there. See, I was before I I went into the military when I got out of high school. I became a military intelligence officer. I learned how to manipulate people and change the outcome of situations. I got out, I became a PI, and then I started working with our friends and organized crime and such. And that's what led me to go into prison. So as an outlet for myself, I enjoyed fucking with the staff. I would keep them on edge, keep them uneasy, make them believe. I would get on the phone and I'd be talking to someone and they'd go, well, what do you got? What's going on there this weekend? And I'd go, well, if they hated me before, they're going to despise me now. And they go, wow, you really have something planned? And I'm like, well, I really can't talk about it. You know, and I'd hang up. The staff believed I was really going to do something. I didn't say what I was going to do, so it wasn't a security issue. But they really believed I was going to do that. And my whole thing is to keep these motherfuckers on their toes. When you're asking a federal prison official, a guard, counselor, case manager, a worthless AW or something, when you're asking them to do something for you, you're not asking them to do you a favor. This is their job. This is what they get paid for. They try to dodge doing it. This was so many years ago, I don't even remember the circumstance. I needed something done. I went to a counselor. Yeah, he was in uniform. He was a counselor. The guy wouldn't do what I needed to have done. And it was within policy. So I got pissed off. I said, did you choose to be a correctional worker? He got all proud. Yes, I did this and that. I go, great. Listen up, numb nuts. I chose to be a criminal. I did my job. Why don't you do your fucking job? Well, the guy threw me out of his office. But then on the other hand, the next day he did what I needed. So you've got to check these assholes. Yeah, they've got a lot of power over you. They do. But you've also got to remain, you got to retain your self-respect and your rights. You got to know what you can and cannot do. You know, you don't want to rat on anybody. You're going to see all kinds of shit going on in prison. Stuff you can't even imagine. You don't want to tell on anyone. You just want to glide your way through, show respect, get respect. But don't let anyone disrespect you. Because if you do, you become vulnerable and you become a victim and the predators are going to be coming after you. Larry, this question is right back at you from a, a bald headed question to a bald guy. Did they always shave defendant's head or was it Alex choice? Because when he went in his first mugshot shaved head, why? I don't know in South Carolina if the state system does that. When you go into the federal system, because that's where my experience is, I've been all the custody levels. People shave their head generally because they want to get the hardcore look. They want to look tougher than they are. Now, maybe. South Carolina shaves people's heads because it's like going into the military. When you first get into basic training, they shave your, they shave your head. They've taken your identity from you. And now you're just another asshole on the inside. You're nothing special. That's what I believe. Hey, AB, back to you. This question here, and then we'll get back to Dr. Rhodes, too. Uh, question. Inmates have to be manipulative while in prison. How do you shake that when you get out or do you not? What is it like for you to be back on the outside after being in so long? Well, when I tell people what I went through and how did I make it out of prison with being who I am, I always looked at prison like being on the streets. It's just that if I'm in New York, I just put a fence around New York, separate the women and separate the guys. And that's how I, that's how I did my time. You know what I mean? And, and it's like I look at I'm in I'm from Westchester, but I'm dealing with the Bronx dudes. They got personality dealing with the dudes from Harlem. You got the dudes from Manhattan. You got the dudes from Brooklyn. It's, it's the personality. But me personally, I've been through the system so I understand it so you know I just I just work my hand work my magic my my business and just did my time you know what I mean my key was to get back to the streets where I can live my life you know so that's what I did that's how I work and then you know today is March 9th 
the, the day that Biggie Smalls got killed. So, you know, 1995, I had the biggest show in the Fed system. I brought Biggie, Craig Mack, and Puff to the jail to do a show for me and for the car, the inmates. So, you know, from that, I was, you know, even though I was the man anyway, but I was the man with the inmates and the staff. But me personally, I mind my business cause the person I thought was all right with me put me in jail. So I had a trust issue. I didn't, I didn't deal with too many people. You know what I mean? So I just stayed to myself and always been low key. Everybody respect me. Didn't have no problems. You had a little jealousy, little nose drop-ins and stuff like that because I wouldn't walk around and talk to everybody. So when you when you don't walk around and talk about talk to everybody, you're a problem. They can't read you. They can't understand you. So they'll do anything to get you off the pound. You know what I mean? They'll tell the COs, oh, he's selling drugs. Oh, he's dealing with an officer. He's dealing with a CO. You know, that's the that's the things that we go through in the prison system. And it's no different than being on the street where somebody jealous of you because you don't know them, don't understand them. They send the police and tell them, oh, he's a drug dealer. He got... He's selling stuff out of his house. That's when he run. So it's no different. It's just like, you know, you just ain't eating what you want unless you got a relationship with a CO that you could keep your mouth shut and he respect you and know who you are. You could get different things, you know what I mean? But it's like everybody's watching you. You got to just move quietly and keep everybody out your business and just do your time and it'll be all right. Shaquille Oatmeal asking, who is that in the dark? That is A.B. Butler. He served decades in prison on a drug charge. He's out now in the music business. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, Dr. Raj, by the way, if you think he sounds like Dr. Phil, number one, he's smarter than Dr. Phil. Number two, he's more charismatic than Dr. Phil. Number three, he's more handsome than Dr. Phil, but he is from the similar neighborhood in Oklahoma. That's why they sound the same. But Dr. Raj, Yes, um, sir. Back to this comment about uh, that Larry mentioned about almost enjoying prison, which is a unique take. I feel like that's something my dad would say. My dad loves to be bored. He, my dad's favorite slogan, better boredom than suffering. That's what my dad always says. <laughs> um, so my dad might enjoy prison. I don't think he'd do too well in there. But what about that, that uh, Larry sort of enjoyed it? Is that a really strange perspective or no I, I thought that was very insightful because let's not forget what what Alex's life was like for years before this time he was a liar wow thank you if you if you're a liar at his level he's a thief at that huge level you know he 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 was narcissistic and paranoid boy life had to been rough every day Alec woke up to live without it. So he, you know, to go someplace where he's got a schedule, he's taken care of, he doesn't have to deal with all the crap that's going on and all the lies, you know, you don't have to remember anything if you tell the truth. But if you tell a lie, ooh wee, and his level of lies to to uh, people that he stole money from, Lord, he, I mean, he's a magna cum laude liar. It's unbelievable, but uh, yeah, I can see where, and and this is wait a minute. This is one thing I wanted to make sure I said during my time. The one thing all three of the men who've been in prison have in common is they're all adaptable. They adapted, so if they can ta- if they can adapt from their life to prison, they can certainly adapt to getting out, and that's why you see all three of the men. That they're not, you know, a bunch of losers. They've reinvented and become who they are. You know, AB is in the music business. Wow. You know, that that didn't, I want you to hear that. Number one is hard to do. And number two doesn't just happen. Or I'm working within the federal system. Whoa, my Lord. That doesn't just happen. These, 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 all three of the men have skill sets 
that they've taken from prison and made their own and made a success out of it. They did that. Well, let me let me give you let me give you an example. I work with some of the biggest artists you imagine. I worked around 50 Cent, Mariah Carey, LL Cool J, Buster Rhymes, my childhood friend, JB Smooth. Y'all might know him on Kirby Enthusiasm as Leon Black. You know what I mean? I worked around some Danny Glover, the actor. I worked around some of the Sherry Shepherd, some of the biggest names that you see on TV around. You know what I mean? Warren G. I, I've been around everybody you imagine. I've been around. Listen to what he's saying. The, the, look, look at the people he's running with. That's not by accident. It takes a lot of skill to run a company effectively. And, and all three of the men have done that, you know? And, and one of the things that they did not, any, all three of them didn't lose in prison is their potential. They, they, were there, they were locked up, they understood the situation, they all adjusted, took their potential in there, kept it, and walked out with it and became who they are today. That that's a great story. And that that's the whole that's the thing I got excited about about the love story because man, we see a lot of bull crap about oh, this is a love story, or that's a love. No, no. Sneaking through the woods, finding somebody. I, and because I've been this way doesn't mean I'm going to be this way forever. I mean, I think that's a, a Hollywood idea of people in prison. No, here's three great examples of men who, who know they did wrong, know that they didn't need to be there, uh, didn't let it beat them, they walked in with walked in there with potential and walked out with potential. That's a great lesson to all the people out there who are watching. And I and I want to say this, man. I was in a notorious prison in D.C. It's called Lawton, Virginia. That's a rough prison. Anybody in the Fed system know about D.C. jail, D.C. Lawton, Virginia, when they shut down Lawton, they sent all the D.C. prisoners in the Fed system. They called, like they was in a prison called Wally Wally in Seattle, Washington. They called Washington and tell them, Washington, D.C., if you don't come and get these guys, we're going to release them. That's how notorious Lawton was. I was on Rikers Island. I did, I've been in some of the the unbelievable jails is crazy. So I, like I say, to that guy, he just got to go in there and do his time because he definitely is a target. AB, anything you want to plug? I know you got to get going. Yeah, listen, y'all can follow me on AB Butler nine one four. That's my Instagram. And, and, and um, when y'all hit me for this, just tagging it, I was on this show where because a lot of time Instagram, it got a lot of spam and a lot of stalkers. So that's how y'all can reach me. A.B. Butler914 on Instagram. All right. Thanks a lot, A.B. I'm going to mute you back up because audio is a little sketch. Um, Love for A.B. here. Larry, to you, Levine is a scary-looking dude. Why the sunglasses? They look good on him. Why not? I get asked that all the time, too. My agent told me never to take my glasses off because the glasses make me look like an asshole. I'm serious. And I'm on network TV. I'm getting ready to go on Ashley Banfield, News Nation. So I got to wrap this up, too, in about 23 minutes. When I'm dealing with people that are going in, I'm not the fucking ice cream man. This prison is a scary place. I need to get them in the right mindset. They don't need to see my eyes. I'll let you people see my eyes. Not a lot of people have. Mm. There. I just showed my eyes to all your viewers. 
Larry, what about this comment real quick? Larry should clean up his mouth, get a dictionary for Larry to learn. You get a, you just said this is not a clean business. You're talking about prison here. I'm dealing with people that are going in from crimes these people can't even imagine. Preparing people to go into custody, get them into programs, dealing with crybabies and their families, and getting them, I don't know, adjusted to immerse into prison society. This is how I talk to my clients. I'm not the ice cream man. And they're going to hear what I'm saying and worse when they go inside. So they need to start dealing with it now and realize they're entering a different world. And life as they know it has changed forever. Scary as hell. That is Larry Levine. And they, got to, they got to realize prison is not a... A uh, play play where you going in there to play and this and that. It's, it's like basically going to the Bronx Zoo. Any zoo you go to and they show you the shocks, they show you the lions, they show you the alligators. There's no dolphins. You got to look at it. There's no dolphins in there. So you got to get yourself, you know, it don't matter how young, how old you are. If you put yourself in that situation, it's problems. You got to look at it. it. Ain't no, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm safe. I'm, I'm respectfully. No, you got to go in there, of being aware what's around you. Because if you're not paying attention, believe me, somebody else paying attention for you, and the person that's paying attention for you, he's not for your good. He's not for the good. Scares the hell out of me. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, by the way, that was A.B. Butler again, once again. And the gentleman in the sunglasses. By the way, Larry, you're a good-looking dude underneath those sunglasses. Uh, Larry uh, was arrested by an FBI Secret Service-led organized crime task force. He was charged with racketeering, securities fraud, obstruction of justice, and narcotics trafficking. He served time and survived at 11 federal corrections institutions. And that is why today he's the founder and CEO of Wall Street Prison Consultants and why he's also a big TV star. You can catch him on Ashley Banfield at 10 p.m. Uh, Dr. Rhodes is a friend of the show for sure now. Dr. Raj, better than Dr. Phil, better than Dr. Drew, more handsome, more intelligent. Uh, your final thoughts on this to close out this show Dr. Roger Rhodes. Hang on. Why am I not hearing you? You have to... Where? What happened to your mic? Oh, there you go. Hold on. You got bounced out there. <laughs> Hold on, everyone. I don't know what happened. Yeah, but you're... you're hang on it. We've got you up here twice. Hold on a sec. Now talk. Okay. okay. Man, it's, it's... <laughs> That'll have to be the last word, Dr. Raj. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to give the last word to Larry, and we'll figure it out. Stay out of trouble. Keep your life clean, and maybe you won't have to go to prison. Maybe you won't need my services. Maybe you won't have to talk to A.B. or Gunner. You know, there's a lot of opportunities out there for people to make money. You can do remote work. Get an education, okay? That's really where it's at. If I had to start it over, I probably would have been a lawyer. I tried to cut corners. I found the lifestyle exciting. I went into prison a father. I came out a grandfather. Hell, I like my grandchildren now better than I like my kids. But the point is, Use your life wisely. Make something out of yourself. Don't use me as an example. Don't use Gunner. Don't use AB. We've all done something to better ourselves since we've gotten out. But I think that if we had a little bit different foundation before we went in, things would have turned out differently. Very well said. I really appreciate all you guys coming on the show. Dr. Rhodes, I apologize for having an issue there. We'll get you back on the next show. Of course, you'll be on soon enough. Andy's school writes, and I have to agree here, these gentlemen are all bright, hard workers, and I'm proud they own who they are, where they've been, 
and where they're headed. Very well said. Where we're headed is tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Detective Phil Waters will be live taking your questions. Former Houston homicide detective. He's investigated over 400 homicide cases. Live with us every week where you get your true crime Phil. Get it, Phil Waters. And Sunday night, this lovely lady, the real version, not the cutout, will be here at 7 p.m. Eastern time. We are going to be following up on the Ellen Greenberg death. She was stabbed 20 times, 10 to the back of her neck and her back. It was ruled a suicide. Something doesn't smell right in Philadelphia. We're going to try to get to the bottom of that. Until then, thanks to all our guests. Love you, America.